Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Greetings and welcome to our time of study in God's Word. Today we are going to start a new series through the book of Revelation. Originally, I was planning to start this series in 2021, but with everything that's going on in our world, I felt like moving that up. So I just want you to know that, and we're going to go, after we're done with Revelation, we're going to go to, um, back to Samuel. We'll, we'll, we'll go through the book of 2 Samuel. So, here we go. We're starting the book of Revelation. The, the title of this first study is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Would you please join me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, we we thank you first for uh, your word, which is living and active. It's able to penetrate into our hearts, into our minds. And Lord, you know know what's happening in history. It's not confusing to you. You have it. You hold it in the palm of your hand. You order it and you sustain it. You sustain our lives. You give us life and breath. So Lord, we, we give thanks to you. Pray now, Lord, that you would use this time as we consider this great text. You would open our eyes, open our ears to the revelation of Jesus Christ in your word. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Revelation, the book of Revelation. It's at the back of your Bible, Revelation 1, 1 through 3. Here's what, here what God's word has to say to us today. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants, the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. On November 27, 1989, the day when communism fell in Czechoslovakia, a Methodist church in the capital city of Prague erected a sign. For decades, the church had been forbidden any publicity, but with the winds of freedom blowing, the Christians posted three words, which summarized not only the New Testament in general, but the book of Revelation in particular, the Lamb wins. Their, their point was not that Christ had unexpectedly gained victory, but that he had been reigning in triumph all along. Richard Bue says this, Christ is always the winner. He was winning. Even when the church seemed to lie crushed under the apparatus, apparatus of totalitarian rule, now at least it could be proclaimed. Given his message, revelation may best be understood by those who are lowly in the world. A group of seminary students were playing basketball when they noticed the janitor reading in the corner. And seeing that it was the Bible, they asked, what part was he reading? Revelation, they answered. And hearing this, the young scholars thought that that he would try to help the poor soul make sense of a complicated book. Do you understand what you're reading, they asked. "Well, Well, yes, he said. And when they smugly inquired about his interpretation, the lesser educated but better informed man answered, Jesus is going to win. Not everyone in church history has shared such a positive view about Revelation. In fact, Martin Luther, that great reformer, was so dismayed by the book, in the preface to his German translation, he argued for its removal from the Bible. Karl Barth, the famed 20th century theologian, exclaimed, "If uh, If only I knew what Revelation was all about. Barth's confusion over this book is shared by many Christians today especially in light of the bewildering interpretations made popular in Christian literature. Ambrose Bice spoke for many when he defined Revelation as a famous book in which St. John the Divine concealed all that he knew. And yet the opening words of the book of Revelation lead us in the opposite direction of that interpretation. Revelation 1.1 begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ. This means that the book's purpose is to reveal something, God gave it to show his servants the thing that must soon take place and made it known to his servant, John. It does not sound like Revelation is meant to confuse or to conceal, since it reveals, it shows, it makes things known. 
And so we begin by finding that Revelation is a message from the triune God through John to seven churches in Asia. And before the salutation that begins, which we'll look at next week in Revelation 1-4, John penned a prologue that provides four vital pieces of information to help us understand this book, which form the four points of this sermon. Imagine that. According to the opening verses, Revelation is an apolitic prophecy, a historical letter, a gospel testimony, and a means of blessing for God's needy people. In light of this blessing, John Stott says this, This last book of the Bible has been valued by the people of God in every generation and has brought its challenge and comfort to thousands. We would therefore be foolish to neglect it. The word, the word translated as revelation is apocalypse from the Greek word apokalustos which is why this book is sometimes known as the Apocalypse of John. The word means the unveiling of something hidden. It's used of a sculpture that had been covered with a cloth which is now pulled away. Or it might be used of a grand building whose facade has been covered by scaffolding, but now with the scaffolding removed, uh, the glory of the architecture is seen. The Apostle Paul has used this word to describe Jesus' second coming in 2 Thessalonians 1.7. The book, of the book of Revelation, to be clear, is going to say a lot about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And its panorama is broader than merely the final days of history. Revelation is more accurately an unveiling of the plan of God for the history of the world and especially of the church. The word apolitic refers to a kind of ancient literature, the name of which derives from the very first verse of Revelation. In fact, earlier forms of this genre began developing before Israel's exile in Babylon, continuing through the intertestimonial period and into the first century. The Bible books of Daniel and Ezekiel are examples of this, and Revelation draws heavily from both books. Apolitic books usually feature an angel who presents dramatic visions to portray the clash between good and evil. These books employ vivid symbols, including symbolic numbers, to depict the spiritual reality unfolding behind the scenes of history. An apocalypse usually contains the message that, that God is going to burst into history in a dramatic and an unexpected way, despite all the appearances that God's people are facing oppression and defeat. And while there are differences between Revelation and other uh, books that focus on the, the end times, it fits basically within this literary genre. Now, realizing what kind of book Revelation is exactly will greatly influence our ability to, to correctly handle this book of the Bible. And when we come to the book of Revelation, we come to one of the hardest, if not the hardest book in the Bible to read and interpret it. So the key to reading and studying Revelation is to have a consistent understanding and application of hermeneutics, which is the art and science of biblical interpretation. A normal hermeneutic means that unless the Bible passage under consideration clearly indicates that the author is using figurative language, it should be interpreted normally. In other words, Bible readers are not to look for other meanings other than the natural meaning in the sentence, nor are they to spiritualize Scripture to assign meanings that aren't there. The clarity of Scripture helps us to understand that the Bible is, in fact, clear, and it's sufficient and authoritative for the people of God. So when we apply this to our hermeneutic, it means that normally our, our uh, explanation, our interpretation of the scripture is to be understood as it's written normally. <clears throat> well, you see, Revelation is full of colorful descriptions of visions which proclaim the last days before the return of Christ and the ushering in of the new heavens and the new earth. The book of Revelation is full of prophecies that find their fulfillment about the end times that are rooted in the Old Testament. The mention of the Antichrist mentioned in Daniel 9.27 is developed fully in Revelation. Other examples of this include Daniel 7-12, Isaiah 24-27, Ezekiel 37-41, and Zechariah 9-14, which contain prophecies that find their fulfillment in Revelation. Now let's be clear about something. John uses the technique of symbolism from the start to the end of his letter in, in this book of Revelation. Instead of portraying characters and events directly, John describes them indirectly by means of symbols. For example, 
Jesus is described as a lamb, and churches are presented as lamps or lampstands, and Satan is pictured as a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. The symbols are sometimes familiar and sometimes original and strange. And whenever a work of literature presents a bunch of symbols instead of realistic details, readers should recognize the te technique of symbolic reality, meaning that as they enter the work in their imaginations, information is presented primarily through symbols. And so the book of Revelation is one of the most sustained examples of symbolic reality in existence. So let's talk about the structure of this book. Revelation opens with a prologue, a body, and ends with, a, with an epilogue. The prologue and the epilogue are linked by an angel sent to show the servants of the Lord what will soon take place. Additionally, Revelation gives blessing on those who read and keep the prophecy. It contains John's self-identification and the, Jesus' designation as the Alpha and Omega. The body of Revelation contains four series of seven messages uh, the, and visions, which are the letters to the churches, the seals on a scroll, trumpets, and bowls of wrath. Revelation moves from things that are, that is, to the seven churches, to the things that are to take place, climaxing in the enemies of God being destroyed and the church presented as a land's bride in a new heaven and a new earth. In Revelation 12, 1 through 6, John portrays the defeat of the dragon in its dire desire, excuse me, to destroy the, the child of the heavenly woman, followed by her flight for safety into the wilderness. It, uh, Revelation 12, 7 through 17, it describes the defeat of the dragon in its desire to accuse Christians, followed by the heavenly woman's flight for safety into the wilderness. Earlier visions sometimes portray later events, and later visions describe earlier conditions. Revelation 6, 12 through 17 shows the shaking of the earth and sky so that the stars are cast to the earth by a great wind. And then in Revelation 7, 1 through 8, John explains the angels restraining the winds of woe until the people of God are sealed. And still later, John sees the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky and only potentially darkened in Revelation 8, 12. The principle of repetition or recapitulation is given to elaborate on God's purposes and to confirm their certainty as is seen in the scriptures. And in Revelation, recapitulation means the order in which John received visions does not necessarily indicate the order of the events that they symbolize. Well, some Christians uh, seek to uphold a high view of scripture by insisting that it always must be interpreted literally. And when applied to Revelation, this rule only breeds confusion. It is true that, that John literally received the, the visions in Revelation, but these visions consist of symbols that must be interpreted not literally, but symbolically. If this is true, the fantastic imagery in Revelation, such as the dragon and his beasts, of the, of the symbolic numbers such as 7, 1000, and 666. And so when we're reading the Bible's historical books, such as we just went through the book of 1 Samuel, and when we're done with Revelation, we're going to go back to 2 Samuel, or the book of Acts, for example. We'll normally take the plain, literal meaning unless there is compelling reason to interpret a passage otherwise. Well, in studying Revelation, we should reverse this approach. We need to interpret visions symbolically unless there is a good reason to take them literally. This is not to say that the visions do not depict real events, whether in John's time or in the future, but that events are presented symbolically rather than literally in the book of Revelation. So not only is Revelation an apocalypse, but it, but it should also be understood as a book of biblical prophecy. In fact, this is jo the reason why John mainly writes his book. And after using the term uh, apocalypse in the first verse, five times he identifies the book as a prophecy, starting with Revelation 1.3 the words of this prophecy. In fact, usually we think of prophecy as foretelling distant events, but the main job of a prophet was to give a message from the Lord and to demand an obedient response. James Boyce says this, prophets speak to the present in light of what is soon to come, and they call for repentance, for faith, and a change in lifestyle. It is in this respect that, that revelation differs from most other apolitic writings since it only speaks of not only of far-off events, but of those that were soon to break upon readers. 
In fact, John says this in Revelation 1, 1 and, and verse 3, the things that soon must take place, urging that the time is near. And so this was not just a way of saying that things, though, though really distant, should seem near, but rather that God was revealing challenges that were immediately before his readers. And so it's for this reason that John is considered an apolytic prophecy. And so while taking an apolytic form, it delivers a prophetic message that is directly relevant to its original hearers, as well as to Christians of all times. As a prophecy, Revelation is best understood within the vision of Daniel 2 which foretold a series of four earthly kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, that would rise up in succession, only to be destroyed uh, when the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, as Daniel 2.44 says. Daniel points out that he is revealing what will be in the latter days in Daniel 2.28. The Greek translation of that verse used, ap Apocalypse, for the idea, is used of, for the idea of God's revealing. And in using the same language, uh, John mimics Daniel 2.22, except that he writes that the reign of Christ that Daniel foretold in the latter days now must soon take place, Revelation 1.1 says. This is all the more important when we realize that Daniel prophesied that Christ's kingdom would rise during the fourth worldly kingdom, the very Roman Empire under which Dan uh, John lived. Excuse me, And so the divine kingdom that John or the divine kingdom that Daniel prophesied from afar, a uh, John prophesied is now happening. And so this shows that the book of Revelation is not merely focused on the final years before Jesus returns, but on the entire church age, the reign of Christ, which began during Daniel's fourth kingdom with his resurrection and ascension into heaven, which continues until Christ's return. And so in developing and expanding Daniel's vision of how the kingdom of Christ overcomes the kingdom of this world, Daniel is organized into seven parallel sections, seven being the number of completion in Scripture. And each section highlights a portion of the story as the drama advances to the final climax. And this climax involves a sequence that was going to happen in John's time that recurs throughout the church age and will take concentrated form in the final days before the return of Jesus Christ. The fairy tales begin their story of a fantasy world with the phrase, once upon a time. In this book, John gives a visionary prophecy of the true story of the world in which we live, beginning with the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation 1.1. His visionary prophecy tells us the most important truths about our world. It, it tells us about what reality is and, and what it's really like. And so he tells us that Jesus Christ, who reigns above, has his church on earth. Do you know that Jesus is in the midst of his church, a bridegroom seeking the love of his bride, as a vision shows him standing among the seven lampstands in Revelation 1, 12-13? And second, did you know that the truth that the world is a dangerous place with, with enemies opposed to Christ and his beloved? He cry, see, Christ's bride, the church, is beset by a dragon, which depicts Satan, who is, who is served by a horrible, ravenous beast, a harlot Babylon, and followers who bear his mark in Revelation chapters 12 and 13. And third, what will happen to Christ's bride, the church, with such deadly foes intent on her harm? Well, Revelation's answer is that God will defend his people. He will judge his enemies, and he will send Jesus with a double-edged sword to slay those who persecute his bride. And so in succession, Christ defeats his enemies, starting with the two beasts and then the harlot Babylon, and finally casting Satan and his followers into the lake of fire in Revelations, uh, Revelation excuse me, chapters 18 through 20. Fourth, after Christ has come to rescue his bride, Revelation's true story of our world ends with the church living happily ever after in the glory of the royal heavenly city, awakening to the, the life forever in the embrace of our beautiful, loving, and conquering King Jesus in Revelation 21 through 22. So you see, by the way, why fairy tales are so popular since they tell the story of salvation that our hearts really, truly long to hear. So you see, the prophetic unveiling of this history is the message of Revelation. Revelation does not primarily intend to present mysterious clues about the second coming, but to be sure, as Revelation advances, it, it narrows its focus on the return of Christ, which brings final victory. But the, but the message of Revelation is this. 
is of God's government of history to redeem his purified and persecuted church through the victory of Christ, his son. And so for this reason, Revelation does not speak to the, to the generation in which it was written only or to a few, future generation uh, when Christ returns. Rather, William Hendrickson rightly explains, the book reveals the principles of divine moral government which are constantly operating so that whatever age we happen to live in, we can see God's hand in history and his mighty arm protecting us and giving us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ so that we are edified and we are comforted. A second feature for us to realize is that Revelation is as a book, it's ground, firmly grounded in, in the history in which it was given. So it begins with the customary letter form in Revelation 1, 4 through 5, giving the name of the writer and the recipients together with a greeting. And it also uh, ends as a letter in Revelation 22, 8 through uh, 21. And so it's appropriate for Revelation to appear at the end of the New Testament epistles. Will, Michael Wilcox says this, It is, in fact, the last and the grandest of those letters. As comprehensive as Romans, as lofty as Ephesians, he says, and as practical as James or Philemon, this letter to the Asians is as relevant to the, to the modern world as any of them. And so Revelation is traditionally understood as having been written by the Apostle John, the beloved disciple of Jesus during the time of his exile on the island of Paphos. And some scholars have argued that another John may have written this book, but the testimony in favor of the Apostle John is impressive and overwhelming. Most noteworthy are the statements of the early church fathers in support of the Apostle's authorship. These witnesses include such writers as Justin Martyr in, the, in 100 to 165, Melito of Sardis in 165 AD, who was the bishop of one of the churches to which John wrote, and Irenaeus in 180 AD, who hailed from Sardis and knew Polycarp of Smyrna, who had been a personal disciple of the Apostle John. It has therefore been claimed that no other New Testament book has a stronger or earlier tradition about its authorship than Revelation itself. And so equally important is the date of Revelation's writing. So the strong consensus among evangelical scholars holds that John wrote Revelation during the last years of the Emperor Domitian's reign, probably around 95 AD. But this, this dating agrees with the early church tradition through our Irenaeus, who said that it was given not a very long time ago since, but in our own day, towards the end of Domitian's reign. And so some scholars argue that, that Revelation was written much earlier, before the fall of Jerusalem, and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So most who hold this view argue that Revelation does not look forward to the return of Christ, but only prophecies Jerusalem's destruction. And so important to this argument is the assignment of the symbolic number 666 to the mad Emperor Nero, who uh, first persecuted Christians in Rome. But there are important reasons, along with Irenaeus' testimony, for giving Revelation the latter date of 95 AD. First, the persecution described in Revelation involves the beast of man for worship, which corresponds not to Nero's, but to Domitian's reign. Second, while there was no empire-wide persecution in Domitian's reign, there is evidence that severe persecution took place in the province of Asia, where the churches of Revelation were recorded, whereas there was no persecution in Asia during Nero's reign. Well, finally, the description of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 fit with the circumstances of a latter day. Indeed, at least one of those churches, Smyrna, may not have existed during the earlier times of uh, Nero's persecution. And so when we realize that Revelation was a historical letter, we see the errors of those interpreters in the so-called Futurist school who view Revelation, most of Revelation as speaking only about events yet to take place. Because Revelation was a real letter to real ancient people, its meaning is relevant and accessible to the original audience. William Hendrickson says this, the, the book of Revelation has as its immediate purpose the strengthening of the wavering hearts of the persecuted Christians of the first century AD. True, this book has a message for today, but we shall never be able to understand what the Spirit is saying to the churches of today unless we first of all study the specific needs and the circumstances of the seven churches of Asia as they exist in the first century. A third feature of the book of Revelation 
is the word of God bearing a gospel testimony to Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, 1 through 2 says, God made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. You see, although John the Apostle was the writer of Revelation, this message came not uh, from him, it didn't originate with him, but from God through Jesus Christ the Lord. The description of how Revelation was transmitted gives us insight into the process known as inspiration. That is, the way in which God used human writers to give a divine message. Many Bible books contain a message that God gave immediately to the prophetic writer who passed it on to other Christians. Here God the Father gave a revelation to Jesus Christ who in turn sent an angel to show it to his servant John so that John could write down the message for the servants of Christ in the seven churches. And so the obvious import of this progression is that revelation does not consist of a message that originate within the imagination of John himself. Moreover, the idea of Jesus Christ as mediator of divine grace is reinforced from the book's beginning. The implication of the divine origin of revelation are significant. First, since God is perfect in all things, his revealed word is inerrant and true in all that it teaches. As God's word revelation and its claims to be reverentially believed, all its promises are to be joyfully trusted and all its commands are to be kept urgently obeyed. And moreover, since God is the ultimate author, not only of Revelation, but of the entire Scripture, there is a unity and a harmony between this book and the rest of Scripture. This means that we can interpret difficult portions of Revelation by comparison with other clearer teachings elsewhere. And indeed, since the images of Revelation are derived from earlier prophetic books, the principle of Scripture, interpreting Scripture, is particularly important when we study this book. And so not only is Revelation God's word, but John specifies it as a testimony of Jesus Christ in Revelation 1-2. Now, now most commentators limit this statement to mean that Revelation is Jesus' testimony to his church. And it's true that, that insofar as it goes that Revelation is a testimony about Jesus as Lord and Savior who is sufficient to meet his people's needs. In this sense, though, uh, Re Revelation is a gospel testimony. Martin Luther complained that, Revel that the book of Revelation has a message where Christ is neither taught nor even shown in it. But this is wrong. Uh, in, it, in the book of Revelation, Christ is the heavenly bridegroom uh, who woos the church his bride. Revelation proceeds to present Christ as the sovereign over the counsels of God for history, the Lamb who alone is, is worthy to open the seals of God's scroll and thus receive the worship of heaven. Revelation concludes with the conquering Christ whose sword cuts down his enemies, who sits on the throne of God's judgment on the last day, and who is blessing the church, Christ's radiant bride, now delivered from all the trials of this world, dwells in the light of God's presence forevermore. This is why over and over in Revelation, the angels and the worshipers, they, they break out above in praise to Jesus. And so we too should respond to the book of Revelation in, in the words of Fanny Crosby who said this, Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. And so this history presented in Revelation is nothing less than gospel, the good news of Christ reigning over history to save the church. And seeing this belies the idea that the gospel is only for those who are yet saved. Revelation is not primarily an evangelistic book. It is an intended audience. It is not the unbelieving world facing divine judgment, but the beleaguered church looking to Christ for relief. And so, to be sure, Revelation is evangelistic. The book even concludes with an invitation to receive the free gift of eternal life in Revelation 22:17. But its gospel message is primarily given to needy Christians, whom Christ calls to courageous faithfulness in light of his gospel reign. Well, finally, like the Bible in general, Revelation is a means of divine blessing for those who read, who hear, and who keep its message. John concludes with this invitation and a blessing in Revelation 1-3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and, and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. 
See, since the God who originated this book is still the God who reigns over all with wisdom and power, those who read and believe Revelation will be supernaturally blessed even today. John specifies blessing first in Revelation 1-3 on the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And so the order of the churches listed in Revelation 2-3 through follows the path of a messenger would take from, from city to city. And so this suggests that John intended the letter to go from one city to the next so that it could be read aloud in each congregation. In fact, in a time of persecution, this action required courage and a strong devotion to Jesus, for which the reader was sure to be blessed by God. And so, just as many of Revelation's visions take place largely amid the worship of heaven, so its reading is an act of worship on earth. David Chilton says this, By showing us how God's will is done in heavenly worship, John reveals how the church is to perform his will on earth. You see, God's blessing was further given in Revelation 1-3 to those who hear and specifically to those who keep what is written. And so to keep the book of Revelation is to treasure his message and obey the commands of Christ in it. This connects with John's description of, of, to his readers as God's servants. And literally the word is doulos, meaning slave. And the point is that true Christians are those who accept the obligation of obeying the commands of Christ and who not only give outward agreement to the Bible, but also conform to its faithfulness in their lives. These servants and these alone are blessed by God through the grace of God that comes from the word of God. And so the urgency of receiving revelation is made clear by the final words of John's prologue, for the time is near in verse 3 of, of chapter 1 of Revelation. And one of the lamentable tendencies in the study of Revelation is to believe that it only focuses on the return of Christ and the end of history. Under this reasoning, many, if not most, sermons on Revelation, they conclude with this question, are you ready for Jesus' coming? And it's true that Revelation foretells a great event that Christians must face. But that event is not the second coming of Jesus, at least not first of, first of all. Rather, this event that in Revelation's view is soon to arrive is the persecution of the Christian church by a bloodthirsty world. And to be sure, Christ's coming is near, either, either through the help he gives us now or in his final coming to end all history. But John's appeal to the urgency of his, of his writing, it pertains to his church's obedience to the, to the commands and the promises of Christ in the face of violent worldly persecution. Every Christian can be blessed now, John promises, through, through the facing of persecution and beset with weakness and sin by hearing and keeping the testimony that is contained in the word of God. You see, we are blessed in our trials by God's word. I, I early compared Revelation to fairy tales such as Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, which, which lift up the hearts of crying children. And for the same reason, God gave the revelation of Jesus Christ to his servant John for the churches of Asia. In this respect, Revelation presents the same message as given by Paul at the end of, Re of Romans 8. And it's true, Paul notes, that Christians in this life are, are sheep to be slaughtered. And yet, when through faith that we enter the glorious kingdom of Christ's resurrection power, Romans 8, 36-39 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so, receiving in Revelation the good news that the Lamb wins, we are blessed above all other blessings to be persuaded that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must remember that, 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 that the culture in which John is writing to, that, that the people there in this culture, it's an, it's an oral culture. And so that this book would have been read out loud um, as the messenger went from, from city to city. And so John promises a blessing to faithful uh, Bible teachers who read today and expound this book, and also to those who hear it with faith and heed what it teaches and commands. You see, reading and studying Revelation is to be done with faith, with reverence, and godly fear as the Word of God and the Word of Christ. We today, we ought to repent of any past neglect of the book of Revelation, and we ought to embrace Revelation as a book God wants every Christian to read and to understand. In fact, the Westminster Larger Catechism, question 157, says we are to read it with a high and reverent esteem, with a firm persuasion that it is the very word of God, 
uh, with a desire to know, to believe and obey the will of God, revealed in it with diligence and attention to the matters and scope of it, with mediation, meditation, application, self-denial, and prayer. We are to read Revelation to obey Christ. John says in Revelation 1.3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. Now, now notice that, that, that God's blessing is not pronounced upon those who own a copy of this book, nor upon those who read it or have it read to them, nor those who specialize in debating about pro biblical prophecy. The blessing is pronounced upon those who read aloud the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it. And we keep the words of this prophecy by cherishing them as the word of God and by applying them, applying them to our lives in a way that as followers of Jesus, we look forward to the second coming of Jesus. We want to live as he lives until he comes for his own. And knowing that this world will pass away, we look forward to a city with a, with a, with, that has as its foundation uh, the, the builder and maker who is the Lord God. And so we live as strangers and pilgrims in this earth. See, Revelation calls Christians to be faithful, to faithful, willing obedience uh, and subjects of King, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. See, the book of Revelation is about Christ the King. Like Psalms 2, it calls on us and all mankind to kiss the Son in sweet submission to Him, lest in the words of Psalm uh, 2.12, you perish in the way for His wrath is quickly kindled. Christ also speaks in Revelation as the prophet who intercedes as high priest while he reigns as king. The book of Revelation calls readers to bow before Christ as prophet, priest, and king, and then to go out and be prophets, priests, and kings, standing under his banner and ministering to a perishing world. To read Revelation is to be prepared for Christ's second coming. Revelation 1.3 says, For the time is near. And the lesson embedded in these words for every person in every age of the Christian church is to be prepared to meet your king in righteousness and peace at all times. We ignore or resist Christ's lordship to our peril. We often bend our knee to the culture, to gurus, to Pharisees, to false teachers, or the idolites of our times. But we need to understand that the sure judgment of King Jesus are sure to fall upon you and I if, if we do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that, that's important. Jesus doesn't want us just to, to give mere lip service to him, but to follow him in wholehearted submission to him. That is why in Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to the disciples that they are to follow him, not just in part of their lives, but to pick up the cross and to follow him as, as Lord and Savior. See, Revelation, reading Revelation, it helps Christians overcome through Jesus Christ. Verse 3 of Revelation 1 says that Christ has power to bless his people even in the midst of severe persecution, and they will be blessed in overcoming the world through faith in his name. Uh, Christ promises this in Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. You see, God's overcoming grace and your overcoming faith will be a blessing to you, enabling you by faith to overcome the powers of evil at work in a wicked world. This is the blessing that Peter pronounces in Acts 2.36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so the counterpart to the blessing is a curse upon those who do not keep what is written in Revelation. Christians who read these warnings are promised blessing, but non-Christians are warned against the danger of despising and disregarding God's warnings, for the end is clear. James 5, 9 says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And here John specifically invokes the wrath of God in the form of a deadly curse upon those who deal lightly or deceitfully with these words, imposing on it their own ideas and words of their choosing or else discarding anything else they, don't, uh, di they disagree with or don't understand. So, dear friend, I encourage you today, to examine yourself in light of the revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ. Are you saved by, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, that blessed Lamb who, as our representative, perfectly satisfied the holy requirements of God's law, who bore God's wrath on a tree and rose victoriously over the grave? 
Are you abiding by faith in the one who accomplished our redemption? Are you being obedient to the Lord Jesus today? Are you prepared to meet Christ the King and overcome sin today through Christ alone? If you have not found blessing in Christ alone, you are ignoring Christ to your peril. You will be cursed forever if you do not repent of your sins and take refuge in the mercy of the Lord of glory. But if you seek for blessing in the reading, the hearing, and keeping of this revelation of Jesus Christ, then you will be blessed indeed. Revelation, it contains a compelling message of faithfulness to Christ amid the spiritual warfare against Satan and sin as the people of God await the second coming of Jesus Christ. See, the death and resurrection of Jesus, it forever changed the course of human history and the history of the world for that matter. But the return of Jesus will also bring about as dramatic of change in the history of man. When Jesus returns, he will destroy all of his enemies with a word out of his mouth, and then he will establish his kingdom with the new Jerusalem. You see, history, we need to understand today, especially in light of the times that we're living in now. History is not moving about willy-nilly in the mind of God. History is moving forward to the glorious conclusion of Christ returning and establishing his kingdom forever and always. Revelation, it tells us this glorious story of the return of Christ so it's vital for us today to read and to study and so we can grow in our understanding of the person and work of Jesus Christ and the end of all history. So this is why we're studying the book of Revelation. We're studying it because it tells us about the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. And it tells us in great detail about this, which in turn it should encourage our souls. It should strengthen our faith. In fact, James 1, 2 tells us, that to consider it pure joy, brothers, when you face trials of various kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and, and we're to let patience have its good work in us. Why? Because it builds character and endurance, and, and, it, and it helps us grow in our in grace. So my prayers today, in, in the midst of all the, the madness that's going on today, be encouraged. God is on his throne. The revelation of Jesus Christ is sure and steady. And we have one who has come. He, we have one who is coming again. We live in between the times. That is, why, that is why John says, for the time is near. You see, the kingdom was inaugurated. It began when, when Christ said in John 19.30, it is finished. And it's going to come to completion, as we'll see, when Christ returns for his beloved. When he establishes his kingdom forever. That, that's that's the not yet that we eagerly look forward to. And Paul in, in 2 Timothy 4, he tells us that, that we are to eagerly long and love the appearing of our Lord. And so I pray that, that as we study this book, we would look, we would look forward to that, to that glorious day and we would love the appearing of Christ and we would grow in the grace of Christ as we behold Christ in all of his glory. And the result is that, that we will grow in holiness as we look forward to the coming day of Christ, we should grow in holiness and trusting ourselves, our witness, our lives, our families, our everything to, to the Lord and committing our lives afresh to him. And maybe today that's something that you need to do. Maybe you've become apathetic and stagnant in your, in your spiritual life. And what you need to understand is that this, this Jesus, this revelation of Jesus that John advances for us in this great book, it's written for a purpose, that we would trust Jesus because as John says, he bore wit in verse two of Revelation 1, 2, it says that he who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. See, Jesus did all of this for us. He is sufficient in every way over, over, over all of our lives, over all of history, over all the cosmos. They are all held by him. They are all upheld by him, by him and they are all sustained by him. And he who sustains us, he who orders, he who uh, all history, he who, who causes it to move and, and, and to be shaped, guess what? This is the same one who says that we are not to be fearful. We're not to be anxious. This, this should give us confidence and resolve in the present. It should encourage us. It should compel us to, to, to godly living and to witness to Jesus. So let's, let's, let's rejoice. Our God is on the throne. He, he knows, he sees, and he loves us. So as we study this, this great book of Revelation, 
May you grow in the grace and knowledge of, of Christ. And may you eagerly long and love the, the soon return, the imminent return of our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the word, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we just thank you for the opportunity to open it, to study it, to consider what it says to us. Lord, Lord I pray as we study this book that you would, that you would strengthen our hearts, our, our confidence, our resolve in the truthfulness of your word. That we would not just cast this aside as, as just mere speculation. But as we study, you would open it, you would unfold it to us, you would help us to rightly interpret it, to grow in your grace, to, to learn more about you, to learn how you order and, and sustain the world that you've created in, in your uh, for your glory. And so, so Lord, help us as we eagerly long for the for the coming of our Lord. Help us, help us to live holy lives, help us to witness to our neighbor, help us to love our neighbor, all because of the grace of Christ revealed in, in your word, in the person and work of Jesus. We give thanks now, Lord, for this time. Pray that that, that, sh, that you would uh, use this a, a, as you do. And we give thanks for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.